Uh, I'm Isabel de Carries, I'm the chair of the trust, um, and I thought it would help to explain very briefly what it is we try to do here, because there are some new faces. Um, in order to do that, I'm going to steal the title of the, um, of the first presentation, uh, which is Guyana Meets Liza. Um, and if I can, I think I can best explain the role of the trust by saying that Guyana meeting Liza is not Guyana meeting Liza across an empty room and eyes locking. Guyana has met many uh, others in the past. Uh, some in the room may remember gold, there was rice, there's been bauxite, tourism, sugar, and others too numerous to mention if you go further back into our history. Um, so I suppose in this sense, the role of the trust is very much to stand there as Guyana prepares for the hot date with Liza and to remind Guyana that it has other encounters in the past and other responsibilities. So yeah. we're I think that we will all agree that energy security will always be at risk whenever a nation has to rely on external suppliers of energy and energy services. And therefore, it is important for us in Guyana to look at opportunities provided by our natural capital endowment, as well as issues of efficiency and sustainability. Uh, my name is Jan Mangal, and the title is Relationships 101. I wasn't quite sure what to call this, and the title changed back and forth, but uh, this seemed to capture, for me, at least uh, the issues. And it's about two entities making a union, a marriage. And uh, that's the theme for a good presentation. Although the upside is huge, there are challenges. And uh, those need to be looked at and brought forward and not ignored. However, the future is bright. But success is not guaranteed. Much work is needed, especially on the part of you, Guyanese citizens, civil society. It's only just the start. Don't expect people to do things for you. Diana has to take ownership. Um, essentially, I would just like to share my thoughts um, on perhaps the need for a new paradigm in infrastructure. How we plan it, how we uh, implement it, how we manage it. Um, again, this year, uh, they announced the discovery of Payera, which, according to the CEO of Hess, uh, he seems quite excited about it. Um, so I think we can reasonably assume that Payera 1 is perhaps of the same sort of order of magnitude as, um, as Liza. So um, when we start production, uh, it's expected that Liza 1 will be about 100,000 barrels a day. Payara coming on stream shortly after, perhaps another 100,000 barrels a day. And we are all, I think, familiar with the social and economic development of our CARICOM neighbor, Trinidad and Tobago. Trinidad and Tobago in 2015 produced 78,630 barrels. So you can see, you know, the scale that we're talking about there. And um, Guyana to date, in terms of the largest public infrastructure jobs we've done, um, Skeldon comes in at number one, $200 million. Um, the Chetty Jagan International Airport Expansion Project comes in at $150 million. The MME, the Agricultural Project, which was developed in 78 to roughly 85, is approximately $100 million. I think it was two loans from the IDB, equal in 90, and given the government's counterpart, it came up to roughly a total of $100 million. And in terms of our largest road project, that's the ongoing West Coast Demerara at 44 million. Looking to the future, the projects take on a completely different scale. Uh, the Linden Lethem Road, for instance, is estimated at 300, in excess of 350 million dollars. A deep water port could be from 200 million. I've seen an estimate for 200. I've seen an estimate for 500. So it's going to be greater than 250 million dollars. The new Damarara River Bridge is greater than $350 million. 
the Crab Island facility, which the government is speaking about, they said that it's going to cost you know, approximately $500 million. We need to have a complete and holistic, I think, national infrastructure plan. Um, this needs to be, of course, looking into the future of 15, 20 years, um, forward-looking. And this plan, I believe, really needs, it has to be as a result of national consultation, and it really needs to have national consensus. Uh, the key thing here, it needs to transcend political cycles because I um, Diplomats are very good at stating the obvious. Um, and that is the discovery of oil and gas here can be a defining moment uh, for the country. Managed well, it can have a transformative impact, boosting economies and fueling inclusive growth across the board. But... Without the right systems in place, a sudden boom or the bonanza that Jan talked about in the extractives industry can have debilitating effects, including by distorting the economy and if fostering conflict and insecurity. Obviously, the first of those two possibilities is what we, want, we all want to see. Therefore, getting the policy framework in place with all the laws, all the regulations, and the necessary standard operating procedures to make everything work is a complex and tough set of tasks for any government. But the importance of doing that work cannot be underestimated. And laws by themselves are not enough. If they're enacted but never implemented or flouted and ignored with impunity, then to be honest, they may as well not have taken place. So implementation, implementation, implementation is a useful mantra to keep in your head. The UK's very clear belief is that only through transparency in the production of oil, gas and mining, as in so many things, can we reduce corruption, make sure that the sector is well government, governed and that the revenues lead to proper development. But whilst transparency helps, it's not much use without a well-informed civil society, which is a key support to the greater accountability for policy decision, contract awards, and the use to which all revenues are put. Civil society is there to ask the difficult questions, such as, who is making policy? Who are they consulting when doing so? Is the government of the day openly tendering oil and developmental contracts? Or are they using OPEC single source justifications to award contracts to their friends or party funders. Finally, let's also have a sense of realism here. Oil, being hugely capital intensive, does not create a large number of direct new jobs. Instead, what it will do is provide the money for government to promote development and create jobs in other ways.